afternoon, everybody. Today we are going to uh, be discussing and going over industry-specific programs, and because there are uh, quite a few subcategories for this, we will be dividing it into two parts. So, just a review of what we did last week, or sorry, three weeks ago. We um, this is an element review for uh, element B, which is hazard identification and control. We talked about the legislation. Uh, identification methods, hazard identification and control program, and the OSI requirements. You're going to see that a lot of what we discussed in that presentation is going to make its way into almost all of the uh, uh, the upcoming uh, webinars and elements that are required uh, for uh, occupational health and safety uh, management system. So our course objectives of today, we've got a few of them. Uh, to become aware of the uh, relevant uh, industry specific control programs and uh, what are they for the manufacturing sector, uh, to become aware of the regulatory requirements for the industry specific control programs, understand the typical structures of a control program, and to identify the uh, and understand the relevance to the OC audit requirements. So, uh, in the first section here, lesson one, our course topics are going to be industry-specific control programs. We're going to uh, review some of the legislation. We're going to go over what the structure of a control program is. We're going to look at what needs to be uh, needed for a program evaluation. And I've added uh, another additional slide uh, that you do not have, something that uh, differentiates between an SWP or a safe work uh, program to a standard operating procedure. And then in lesson two, we're going to go over the OSI requirements and the industry-specific control programs. So in lesson one, we've broken this down, uh, an introduction, industry-specific programs, legislation, I've just said that. So here are the first seven of industry-specific control programs. The first one is contract safety management, mobile equipment, confined space entry, radiation, Lockout de-energization, hot work, fall protection, sorry, industry specific um, process safety monitoring, WIMIS, hearing conservation, MSI prevention, industrial storage racking systems, machine safeguarding, fixed overhead cranes and hoists, and working alone. We will be breaking each one of these down into uh, further detail uh, further on in the webinar. So I've added here some other industry control programs that are not necessarily in the audit. The first one here, industry management return to work. It is in the um, micro um, audit. However, there is the current freeze from WorkSafe BC on your, uh, this is an additional 5%. If you get OC certification, you get the 10% rebate off of uh, your premiums. To have an industry um, management and return to work program um, in the past has given an additional 5% uh, rebate on uh, your premiums which makes it a 15% rebate in total. They put a temporary freeze on this because um, they weren't getting the numbers of uh, return to work um, related uh, statistics that they wanted. It is supposed to come to a conclusion by the end of this year. Uh, whether they're um, and what new requirements they're going to have for the audit. That being said, some of the other control programs that uh, are noteworthy are violence in the workplace, a bullying and harassment, and if you go for those two specifically, if you go to the WorkSafe BC site, they have a template for policies, procedures, how to investigate, and reporting functions on both of those. They're nice, easy templates that you can put your name your company name in on and then uh, roll those out that way. It even gives instructions, as I said, how to do the investigations and what the procedures are. Another one is a respiratory program. So if any of your um, employees are wearing respirators, then you need to have a respiratory program. And of course, with every respiratory program comes an exposure plan to whatever particulates you're being protected of. And the last one there is combustible dust. I can see this in the future becoming part of all audits because of uh, the recent history here in BC with the uh, up north with, with the accidents that happened there. 
So some of the legislation, each one of the uh, subcategories in this part has either a section related to it in the Workers' Compensation Act or in WorkSafe BC regulations. So just a reminder again, anything that says WCA is the Workers' Compensation Act and anything that is has a part number, as we can see, for instance, mobile equipment part 16.2 to points to 16.48. That is part of the WorkSafe regulation. So each one of these has its um, its place and reference in the regulation. So one of the best places to look for information is to go to the either the Workers' Compensation Act or um, WorkSafe BC regulations. And under each one of these sections, WorkSafe does offer additional resources that are free downloads. I know specifically for confined space, lockout is a good one as well. Uh, fall protection has one and WIMIS has one. And we'll talk about that as we go through the presentation. So the purpose of this slide here is just to show that uh, everything that we're talking about and the different elements that we have, have a section with the regulation or the legislation. Additional to the other ones that we mentioned here of the 15 subcategories, they have their parts in the regulation. Now moving forward towards OC certification, if these do not apply to your company, then they are taken out of the audit. You do not lose the points for that. It just lowers the end total of what it would be. So if some of these do not apply to your industry, then they, they don't apply in the audit. You don't lose marks. You're just not graded on it. So the structure of a, of a control program looks very similar to what we talked about last week, or sorry, last webinar in what a hazard identification looks like. So our first step is to identify and list the equipment, machineries, and or tasks, list the necessary steps in sequential order, identify the hazards, use a risk matrix, what is it going to be, an A, B, C hazard, use the hierarchy of control, can we eliminate it, substitute it, have in the, admin, uh, engineering controls, do we have administration controls, or lastly, PPE, Develop the standard operating procedures, the SOPs, and then what kind of training do we have? Is there supervision? Do we have competency tests that we can prove that the training is efficient and, and effective? And then we have regular inspection slash maintenance, that's and or, because sometimes they're both. And then uh, for all control programs, we need to have a program evaluation at the end of it. Usually this is done yearly. That's the easiest way to do it, and we'll get into that later. The next slide here, we're looking at program evaluation. So how do we evaluate what program you have in place? Um, the first point here is ultimately it is the responsibility of the employer. They are responsible for the yearly review. However, if you can see the last point there, the more we can involve workers, the better. So if we're uh, a small company that doesn't have, we're 19 or less, worker involvement is key. If we were 19 or sorry, 20 or more, we would involve our Joint Health and Safety Committee members and workers as well. Another thing to do is to set yearly goals and objectives. So anything that we're moving forward with through this webinar is to set a goal for it. We should be setting goals for this last quarter of this year and for next year, depending on where we are in the webinar series, anything moving forward, we can write down as a, a goal and an objective. One thing we have to make sure that we do when we do that is to make sure that we identify what needs to be done, who needs to be involved and what the target dates are for that. A program needs to be kept current and active. We talked about leading and lagging indicators. We should have a mixture of both of those uh, when we look at internal and external stats. And I put an asterisk beside the next point here, the employer planning toolkit. It's something that we haven't discussed at this point yet, but um, I'm going to try and fit it in somewhere in the webinar series here. This is a free tool provided by WorkSafe that can uh, you can look up your stats. It shows your trending, your injuries, your time loss. One of the key items that most companies find interesting is it will plot you or your company against other competitive companies in your industry to see where you are. It does not give a name, it's just a dot on a graph, but it will highlight where you are in comparison to fellow industry in, in your section. So that's program review and evaluation. So one of the things before we get going here is I want to talk about the difference between an SWP and an SOP. 
So an SWP or safe work process or, or safe work program is basically used as a basic low-level hazard identification and risk. And I'll show an example here in a minute. Whereas the SOP is very detailed on how to accomplish uh, a specific task or how to operate equipment or machinery. This one is often referred to as uh, work instructions. And my examples, it should be, uh, I think I've picked some good examples here of what I come across often. So you can see on this next one, safe work procedures. It is the same if it's uh, SWP, JSA, JHA, SJA, or THA. In health and safety, there are lots of acronyms. All of these mean the same thing. If you look on the right side there, it says, here's an example, keep hands, body clear of, lift using proper techniques, do not wear jewelry or loose clothing. It's very generic um, and, and general. Uh, it does have its purpose, and we're going to talk about some of the elements that this is the proper way to do it as opposed to a standard operating procedure. The next slide here is the standard operating procedure. It's more along the lines of an instruction manual and it ensures that it is done the same way each time. So I took the first three, sorry, four points off of one of the SOPs that one of my companies had. So pull out the emergency stop button, press machine start button, lift blade by holding down the heads up button, and then open the front vise while holding the front vise open button. So you can see how it's very descriptive. It's telling you exactly what to do and how to operate the machine. If we go back a page, it's very different from keep your hands and body clear of, use proper lifting techniques, do not wear jewelry or loose clothing. So there's, there's places for both, and we'll get through that uh, as we move along here. So in short, that's our quick summary of the introduction. We talked about the industry-specific control programs, what legislation, where to find it, what a structural control program looks like, and it's very similar. Uh, it's just got one or two more points than what we did uh, in the last webinar with the uh, hazard ID and control, how to evaluate your program, and the difference between a safe work practice and a uh, standard operating procedure. Okay, lesson two, the OC specific requirements. This is the industry specific control programs. So for the first section, the criteria for OC is that um, there are 15 control programs or sub-elements in this category. You need an overall of 50% in this element or every other element moving forward. And this element specifically uh, counts for 10% of the overall audit. And the last point here is you need an overall of 80% to pass the audit. The next slide will help. Uh, explain the, uh, the percentages here. So here we have a breakdown of what would be the uh, small employers audit, OC audit. So we have all the elements down on the left hand side A to J. We have the available points for each one of them. We can see that the next element beside that is the element weighted scores. We can see that not all are equal. So the two highest are hazard ID and control and the training and education and communication, whereas contractor management is only 5%, the rest are 10 So again, overall, we need no less than 50% in, in any one of these elements, and we need to have an overall score of 80% or above. Element C is very interesting with the subcategories. We can have one of the sub-elements that is not at 50%, but we need to have a minimum a 50% for all the industry specific elements that apply uh, to your company. So again we have this slide shows the different elements, the available points, how it's weighted. We need a, no less than 50% in any one of the elements A to J and we need to have an overall average of 80% to, to be OC certified. This is an example specifically of what the audit would look like for you guys because we're small employers you guys get to uh, audit yourself however you do need to supply proof and a copy of your program so this is an example of management owner, owner commitment this was our first webinar you can see it's just a yes or no so if we look at one a 1.1.1 safety policy statement do you have one yes or no 
he would click yes. Does the statement have the responsibilities for all parties, manager, supervisors, worker, yes or no, click yes. And then that's how it will automatically grade you as you go. So the plan is, is as we move through the webinar that we are uh, referencing this as, as you guys are developing your elements, you can see where you're scoring your points. You're just going to have to be able to prove that. And again, if, if you need any help at any point, reach out to me by an email and uh, I'll, I'll help you as best as I can. So the purpose of this slide was just to show what the actual audit looks like for a small employer. You guys get to do it yourselves. We're not having a third party come in and you're not getting charged for that. As a small employer, you guys do your own. You just have to be able to grade yourself, uh, have the supporting documents. It'll go to the OC department. They will reference it to make sure that you are awarding your points correctly. And then on successful completion of that, it then gets forwarded to WorkSafe for final approval. And then you can get your certification and WorkSafe will uh, issue the rebate. So breaking down the industry-specific control programs. The first one is contractor safety management. We have a few points here. Any contractor that comes on site needs to be in good standing with WorkSafe BC. So the way to do that is to get a clearance letter. Um, what this does is allows the company to know that whatever their contractor is, is in good standing and is paying uh, their premiums to WorkSafe BC. Why does that matter to you? If they do not and are not registered with WorkSafe BC, and they get hurt on your site, you are considered the prime contractor and then it becomes your responsibility with anything associated with that claim. So I've seen people and contractors get hurt who were not in good standing and the entire claim goes against that company that had the contractor out on site. So the best way to get a clearance ladder is to go and you can easily do a pipe into Google URL, WorkSafe BC clearance letter, and it'll punch up a, uh, a, a form that you can fill out. You can put in the company name or number if you know it, and they'll give you a clearance letter. There's also a, a function where if you deal only with the few, it'll track it and um, it'll hold it for a year, I believe it is, and they'll let you know each year who's in good standing and who's not. Uh, one of the other things we need to do with contractor management is you're meant to make sure that they have an OHS document uh, program and training themselves. This is very difficult at times when you're using a mom and pop shop. So another small employer, they may not have a health and safety program, uh, but they are meant to. There should be a statement in your contractor management policy and element that they need to adhere to uh, your safety rules, policies, and procedures. There should be written responsibilities for subcontractors. There should be regular inspection of work and worksite conditions. And if they're having other meetings with OHS and other employers, that all needs to be documented. What I like to do is develop a safety contractor orientation, just like a new worker orientation. It's a safety contract orientation, and this is the it's a good way to prove your due diligence and, and it's a simple thing that could take only 10 to 15 minutes to do but you need them to sign off or discuss that you've had the discussion with them that there's a statement to report all injuries. Uh, they also need to know how to summons first aid whether that's small enough that you can get away with just yelling or a lot of places have an air horn and it's usually one blast or one long blast or three quicks. One is an evacuation, three is first aid or whatever it is that you like, you need to let contractors know, one, how to do that, and two, what to do if they hear that. They also need to know where the location of the first aid is, so whether that's a, a room or inside the building, or it could be a sea can outside the building, and where the muster station is. So if there is an evacuation or if there is an emergency, where do they go? We need to let them know that. There should also be uh, a statement there and something for them to know who to contact for a health and safety concern. Maybe they have a concern that they need um, some clarification on. We also need to let them know of the possible hazards in the area that they are working in. And then again, uh, the uh, WorkSafe BC clearance letter. The next section here is mobile equipment. 
So what we need to do, you'll see that there's a general theme. The first one is to create an inventory and list of all mobile equipment. So that includes a forklift, a scissor lift, a boom, whatever, if you have it. Develop a hazard assessment for the work being done. Create an SOP or SOPs for all mobile equipment. We need to ensure that all operators are trained. I've seen this happen uh, too often where companies allow anybody to jump in and on a forklift and I've seen a lot of companies get themselves in trouble in written orders and uh, two of them were fined because they were repeat offenders. So we need to make sure that our operators are trained. We need to assign individuals to conduct pre-shift inspections uh, with an appropriate form. So a good example of this is a forklift. Uh, with a smaller company, um, it may be just the first operator of the forklift that day needs to fill out the form, or I've seen it where just an individual goes around and can, that's his his or her first part of the day is to go around and do the pre-shift inspections on all mobile equipment. But you need to make sure that it's filled out on a form and the form is done daily, or every day that the equipment is being used. So if we have a forklift and it's getting used every third day, then every third day there should be an entry on a form. You also need to create a process and have a statement that identifies and ensures that defects are taken care of. So what happens if you do the forklift inspection and there's a broken light or a hydraulic pipe or hose that's leaking? How do you take it out of service and who do you report it to? Uh, there needs to be a policy statement on that. The next category here is confined space entry. So you need to list or create a list of all confined spaces. This will be entry and non-entry. You need to do a hazard assessment for each type of these confined spaces and this is specific here it needs to be done by a qualified person so most companies do not have a qualified person to do a hazard assessment for a confined space so this needs to be third partied out we ourselves are one company that does offer this service um, and we offer free scopes and the next step would be to have our confined space specialist write a hazard assessment and the SOPs that are associated with those confined spaces. We then need to individualize entry procedures. So have standard operating procedures for the different configurations of the confined spaces. It's not the same to have something where the manhole is at the top 20 feet up in the air as opposed to something where it's three feet off the ground. We need to have separate standard operating procedures for each one. We need to have an entry permitting control system. So what this is, is documented entries and documented testings before a worker goes in. We need to have proper records of any and all entries. We need to have the appropriate training for at-risk workers. So these are anybody that, that enters the confined space. So even if you enter a confined space once a year, it is still considered a confined space. We still need a hazard assessment. We need a standard operating procedure, and we're going to get into the rescue procedures. And there needs to be the a documentation of the maintenance of safety equipment. For a lot of wineries, breweries, microbrewers, we have a lot of confined spaces. We need to not only make sure that we have standard operating procedures on how to enter it, we need to have standard operating and rescue procedures, which is on the next slide. But we also need to have a maintenance record for any kind of safety equipment that's used, that it's regularly inspected. So our next one is radiation. We need to have a list of inventory of all radiation sources. We need to do hazard assessments for each type done by, again, a qualified person. This is something that we're looking to develop within house here. This is a service that we're looking to do, but uh, it needs to be done again by a qualified person. Then we need to develop this, uh, any kind of standard operating procedures. With any kind of radiation, we gotta do swab testing based on the source. We have to have the appropriate training. We have to have document records, training and maintenance and inspections. And then again, have emergency procedures for if something goes wrong. Lockout and de-energization. Our first step, Identify all energy sources that require a lockout. Now we start with anything that is we considered hardwired. That means it runs directly to a panel that you cannot unplug. If you can't unplug it, it's called a hardwire. If you can unplug it, it's called a softwire. So one, we have to identify all energy sources. 
So whatever it's running, we then need to develop a hazard assessment for each one. We need to develop the standard operating procedures for each one. I highly suggest that we develop a lockout template. There are five categories that uh, WorkSafe asks for a minimum. And uh, we have a template that we can provide where you can quickly put a picture in and it helps identify the five steps. The five steps are identify what needs to be shut off. Turn it off at the piece of equipment or uh, machinery. Then you go to the fuse panel and you turn that off. Then you put a lock on it and a tag out and you write down why it was locked out, who locked it out, lock it out, and then you go back to the machine or equipment and you try and restart it. They're the five basic steps. We can add in additional steps if there's hydraulics, gravity, pneumatics. Uh, we add in another step because you'd have to bleed that off as well before you go back and try and restart it. But WorksAPC's lockout regulations is asking for a minimum of five steps. They have a nice um, uh, supplement material if you go to the website and look under the uh, lockout category. It, it, it has a nice videos and uh, PDF version there. Again, we have to have the appropriate training for at-risk workers. We have to make sure that our contractors know and are trained in lockout. Um, I come from a construction background. I have my air conditioning, refrigeration, mechanics license and my gas fitters license. I've worked on some very big commercial sites and I have seen it get very ugly with someone either cutting off a lock or not putting a lock on. Industry specific control programs, so hot work. So hot work is when you're doing any kind of welding or grinding that is not part of your everyday business. So my foundries, uh, companies that are building the uh, vats for breweries and wineries, they're welding and they're in hot work all the time, so this does not apply to them. But if you have contract work where someone has to fix a line for you or has to do some of this work, that is considered lockout. So for anything that, or sorry, hot work. So for anything that's hot work, we need to identify all the work that needs to be considered uh, as hot work. So maybe it's uh, yearly maintenance and we're, we're doing a, a lockout for something. We need to develop a hazard assessment for the work to be done. We need to develop this is one where we can develop a safe work practice or procedure. We can be very generic here that we need to do this, we need to check for that, we need to clear the area of flammability, we need to make sure that we have an extra fire extinguisher on site. Maybe we need to have a secondary check an hour after the work is done to make sure that uh, everything's cooled down and we don't have something uh, smoldering or what have you. The next one here, a formal hot work permit, very similar to the confined space. And what you're going to see with fall protection is you need to have a permit. So if this is not your normal everyday industry that you're uh, welding and grinding, then we should have an issuing permit that we have a checklist of things that need to be required there. The issuing of authority of the hot work permit, that is someone that can say yes or no. So someone's usually in charge of that, that has the, 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 the permit to allow it to happen. Then we have the appropriate training for the permit issuers. So and the appropriate training for the at-risk worker. So if I'm doing some grinding, then I need to get it approved. I need to fill out the form, get it done. And then we need to have a course training records uh, for all workers and retention copy of all permits. For fall protection, very similar to everything else, we need to identify all work areas that are considered working at heights. We need to develop a hazards assessment for each scenario and then develop uh, SOPs for working at heights. An example to show the difference here is I had a company that did use harnesses on an infrequent uh, level and, and time frame and they were able to develop separate standard operating procedures, one for uh, a static line which runs horizontally and then they had a vertical line or a lifeline that uh, went over top of a roof. So there's uh, we had different standard operating procedures for the different kind of scenarios. Again, we need appropriate uh, training for at-risk workers. If anybody is putting on a harness, they need to have a fall arrest training. Fall protection agreement for contractors, you need to make sure that they have their ticket, that they know what they're doing. Otherwise, you may potentially be on the hook. Again, you need to make sure that they're in good standing because we want to try and make sure that we don't become the prime contractor because when you're the prime contractor, all the responsibility falls on you. 
uh, and then we need to develop a formal working at heights permit issuing system. We need to have an authority of working at heights permit. So again, that someone's in charge to allow this to happen, that has the paperwork that gives the green light for it to happen. We need the appropriate training for the permit issuers. We need the appropriate training for the at-risk workers. We need to document the inspection of fall arrest or fall restraint equipment. This is one that often gets missed. We need to have some kind of documentation that when someone's donning the harness that they're actually inspecting it for cuts, tears, wears, uh, making sure the D-ring's in the right place, still suitable, uh, looking at ropes, uh, carabiners, and the anchor points. We need to look at all of those. Uh, we need training records for the workers to show that they are, are have received training. And of course, we need to keep any of those um, keep the records of training and keep the records of working at height permit. Industry safety monitoring. Here we need to again create an inventory of areas requiring monitoring. So um, we need to develop an assessment for each area requiring the monitoring. We need to develop the SOPs. We need the appropriate training for at-risk workers, maintenance, personnel, and contractors that they need to go in clearly defined responsibilities for the system maintenance. We need to have specific emergency response procedures and we need regular calibration schedules. We also need to have fixed gas monitor maintenance records. We need to have the appropriate training for at-risk workers, maintenance personnel. We need entry procedures following alarm when the levels are uncertain and we need regular audits to determine compliance with the above. So. I've had companies that have um, gone to the point where they have the self-breathing uh, apparatus, they have the little rescue bottles, so if someone was to fall unconscious and they're in an oxygen deficient area, that they have rescue procedures where someone can now enter that area safely and get that personnel out. Um, relying on emergency services, is um, the time frame on that is uh, it's too long before they can get on site, so most companies, almost all of them, uh, do this in-house. So our next one is WIMIS. So uh, we're calling it WIMIS still, that's what the audit is, but although we are moving towards GHS, which is the Globalized Harmonizing System, and the difference basically is the GHS is um, set up so that it doesn't matter what country you uh, are buying product from, that the symbols are all the same, so it's very uh, universal. So with WIMIS, we need a hazard assessment to identify all the chemicals that are on site and their potential risks. So we also need an inventory of chemicals, their uses, storage, locations, and quantities. Generic worker training and specific work safe train or specific training for at-risk workers. So the generic training would be uh, your, your WIMIS training, where we learn what the symbols are, what the hash marks mean, different parts of uh, an SDS, or what was known as the MSDS, which was your material uh, data safety sheet. It's now called the SDS, which is just your safety data sheet. And then we have to have specific um, workplace training. So this is when you're working with a specific chemical that the employee knows what the specific hazards are to them while using this chemical. We need to ensure that there's proper labeling as required. Uh, many a time I've people use empty water bottles and I've seen people drink things that weren't water. Um, it sounds very silly and but it, it's happened quite numerously actually. Current material data sheets or SDSs are meant to be no older than three years old so they need to be up date. One of the best ways of getting around this is when we have uh, a program that um, stores all your health and safety manual and um, is your software that you go to the website of your supplier. Puts the onus is on them, however it does need to be checked, but when you get the URL for say a bleach from the supplier, they have a, a their own responsibility to make sure that they have the most current. It just saves uh, a company always having to update their uh, SDS sheets. I know for some of my foundries that I worked with, they had, I believe it was three six inch binders of chemicals. So they had over, I would say over 300 different kind of chemicals 
and it was quite a, a task to keep them up to date every three years. Once they went electronically, it made it it reduced the workload by 80 percent, considerable. We need to make sure with WIMIS that there are emergency cleanup procedures and rescue response, and we need to make sure that we have proper eyewash stations and chemical showers as required. So a lot we can find that out on the MSDS sheet. It'll tell us whether we need it. There are regulations on um, how far away from uh, a point of using the chemical that we need to have an eyewash station or a chemical shower. So the difference between WIMIS awareness and WIMIS training. So WIMIS awareness is knowing what the symbols mean. WIMIS training means knowing what the chemicals do to them. A successful WIMIS program is when any employee or all employees should be able to answer the following four questions. What are the potential hazards of the chemical being used? How do they protect themselves against the hazard? What to do in the case of a spill? And where to go to find more information if they require it? And that is the um, SDS. So there are the four questions. You know you have a successful WIMIS program when any of your employees can answer these four questions. Again, with the WIMIS, if you go to WorkSafe BC site, they have under their supplement material, they have two excellent PDFs with competency tests in them in regards to WIMIS. Uh, I use it quite often and um, it's quite easy for uh, most companies to implement uh, a WIMIS training program. There's also the option of uh, using a third party and going online or having someone come in and uh, train your staff. The next one is the hearing conservation program. So. Again, we need to create a list of the areas requiring the hearing protection, complete a noise survey if it's required. The general rule is if you're at arm's length away from someone and you need to yell or raise your voice to communicate with them, there's a very good chance that you need a safety, uh, a hearing conservation program. If we're measuring it out in uh, using a sound meter, uh, anything that is over 83 dBA requires a program, anything over 85 dBA requires uh, hearing protection. And remember, we're measuring in dBAs. It's not on here. It's measured on a logarin system. So when you go up three points in dBA, you've doubled the volume. But anyways, that's for a noise survey. We need to develop any kind of administrative control. So again, this could be engineering, could be acoustic panels. It could be policies, procedures that you need to wear hearing protection while in this area. And then your PPE would be whether you've got little roll-ups, you've got custom earplugs, you've got muffs, or at some places they even use uh, uh, helmets. So you need to develop uh, the appropriate administrative controls. You need to have training, and most times this is done in crew talks, but it's nice to have something written down as well that they fill out. Uh, I'm very strong on, on having competency tests because it's another way to prove uh, due diligence for a company that uh, you can prove that someone was able to answer the questions and just didn't sit through a coup talk and nod their head. But we need to have training on the potential hazards of exposure to noise and the proper use and maintenance of hearing protection, requirements for wearing hearing protection in noise zones. So this could be either a statement and or signage. Most go, we need both of them, having signage and having a policy saying, uh, while you're in this area or on the shop floor, um, hearing protection is required. And then we have audiometric screening within the first six months of employment. This is key for new uh, young workers. The reason why WorkSafe has this is the majority of young workers coming into the workforce nowadays are already coming in with a hearing impairment. That's mostly because of earbuds and listening to music too loud. So if they're going to be a 25, 30 year employee, the last thing we want is them to try and pin it back onto the company that they, uh, their hearing loss was attributed to the company. We need to do audiometric screening or hearing tests yearly. What I suggest is once a year, you get the majority of your company and, and employees tested. Then you schedule a day six months later and what this does is just picks up the person or people that were away on vacation or sick that day. That eliminates and um, 
there being a gap where you haven't tested anybody in six months. This is in the regulations. I've never seen anybody enforce it. However, it is there. So WorkSafe does have grounds to take action on this. So the best way to do this is do your annual testing, set up a, uh, another day uh, six months later to catch anybody that was on vacation or, or sick, and then uh, you've eliminated the window where someone could be missed. We need to have the audiometric testing screening for all at-risk workers. Most third parties forward this testing to WorkSafe BC. They do that on their own. It's usually not the responsibility of the company. Your uh, provider will do that. But the company does need to have a reference letter for workers who have suspected hearing loss to see their physicians. You can hand fill this out. <clears throat> I have templates for them if you need them. What this does is, as a company, you need to give the employee the form, have a copy of it, that you've signed it to them. Whether they go and do something about it, it's on them, but our due diligence is that we filled out the form saying that there was a change from one hear, uh, hearing test to the next. So MSI, musculoskeletal injury prevention. So we need to create an inventory of MSI scenarios. We need to develop pop, proper risk evaluation processes. This is a bit different than a hazard assessment. There are uh, specific uh, occupational hygiene principles that we get into. Uh, we need to develop a risk assessment for jobs identified as presenting ergonomic risk factors. This could be something simple as just observing or knowing uh, what the potential could be, or we look at our history of where uh, our injuries are happening. This could be uh, lifting heavy objects, twisting with objects, um, repetitive. We need to implement control measures using the sound occupational hygiene principles. This is a great place to have safe work practices based on the hazard assessments. We need to have appropriate training for at-risk workers. We need to have training records for workers. And again, we need to evaluate this program yearly or when there's significant changes to the workflow or processes. Our next one is industrial storage racking system. This is the big one right now. There's new legislation coming around this. So we need to install industrial racking systems to manufacturers or professional engineered uh, instructions. Organization has to perform a needs assessment that includes what products are being stored on it, uh, the material handling equipment, most times this is a forklift, and the facility characteristics, so whether it's inside, outside. So this section here deals with racking that is loaded and unloaded with a forklift. If it is something that is on a mezzanine level that you're hand bombing, that you're doing on your own, that is not considered the racking system that this section is referring to. This is referring to the, the racking system that is you know, what are they, 15, 20 feet tall, the pre-engineered racking systems. We need to have safe work procedures for storing and retrieving material on the racking system. Most times what I ask is a company to do a standard operating procedure for a forklift and to describe how to load and unload off of a shelf. This kills two birds with one stone because the one SOP will count for forklifts and it will also count for loading and unloading off of a racking system. And then the last one here is we need to have a process to ensure that the damage to storage racking system is reported, documented, and corrective action. So if something falls off and hits one of the braces or we have a forklift that backs into and dents uh, one of the uprights or the beams, we need to take action on that and uh, replace it or fix it. Our next section here is machine safeguarding. We need to create an inventory of all all required safeguards. We need to develop a hazard assessment for each piece of equipment. So we can do a, a general hazard assessment for a piece of equipment, but we can break it down looking at the potential hazards of, of where, because you can have one piece of equipment that has multiple safeguards on it. That's what I'm trying to get at. The way to, get a, uh, to deal with that is develop administrative control. So <clears throat> our first step would be, again, using the hierarchy of control. Eliminate if we can do it, substitute if we can do it. More than likely, it is an engineering control. Then we have our admini uh, administration, we have policies, procedures, uh, and training, and then we have our PPE. We need written instructions for the mandatory use of safeguards. So this is a statement in this element saying that safeguards must be 
uh, used and not taken off. Uh, we need to perform inspections to ensure that safeguards are in place and maintained. And we need to have a written process uh, very similar to uh, defective equipment is how to report missing safeguards. Our next section, fixed overhead um, cranes and hoists. We have an inventory of cranes and hoists. We need to develop a list of what they are. We need to have safe work procedures for all cranes and then develop the standard operating procedures for each one of these. The operative of cranes and hoists need to receive training. The cranes and hoists and rigging are inspected as required by applicable regulations. This usually means a third party to come in yearly to look at your cranes, whether it's jib crane, overhead crane, uh, gantry crane. We also need to make sure that we're looking at our um, chains and straps. Uh, the chains will have a stamp put on them. Uh, the cranes and hoists and rigging are serviced and certified by the qualified persons. So working alone or in isolation. Um, again, we need to complete a hazard assessment to identify any of the work of working alone or in isolation. Uh, complete general or specific hazard assessments for the employees working alone. We need to look at safe work procedures that include the roles and responsibilities for who's going to check on who, how frequency that is done, and mandatory check-ins at the end of each shift. This is where I've seen things go a little sour a few times with companies where this is where this section breaks down where someone thought that someone else was going to do that safety check. The frequency of the checks depends on um, the hazards of what Ever work is being done, working in an office is a lot different than working on a, a milling machine, let's say. And then the mandatory checks at the end of each shift is often missed. So that is our summary for lesson two. We looked at the part one of the industry-specific control programs. Course summary topics. Today we went over industry-specific programs part one. We went, uh, we listed them all. We went over the legislation requirements. Lesson two here we discussed the OC requirements. I showed an example of what the uh, micro or small employer audit looks like. It's something that you guys can do yourselves. You just need to have the supporting uh, documents to prove it. It breaks it down nicely for you. When it gets to the specific industry programs that we're dealing with, it's just asking you whether you have a program, yes or no. That's why the slides, some of them were in more detail than the others, is because that's what we need to build on to uh, score your points and it's not just about scoring your points it's providing your due diligence when we have this developed you're providing your due diligence in case we need to protect ourselves in case something goes wrong hopefully it never happens but we need to be in a situation where we've done the best that we can we've done what any other reasonable company would have done and we've proven our due diligence thank you very much and we will see you then